Okay, great. Here we are. We are live on Facebook. So thank you so much for joining us today, everyone, for this discussion that we are calling Taking Stock of Rural Mental Health. My name is Olga Robeck, and I am the Public Information Officer for the Colorado Department of Agriculture. I am joined today in this panel discussion by healthcare professionals and experts from across Colorado who work directly with rural communities to bring mental health resources to farmers and ranchers. I am so glad that you could join us today. So before we begin, I wanted to really thank all of you uh, who are here on Facebook, and I wanted to thank all of the panelists who are here with us, and let our viewers know that after we do some brief introductions, we will begin a informal conversation about mental health in Colorado's rural communities. So we will open our line for questions. If you have questions and you're watching us on Facebook Live, please use the comments section to add your question in, and we we will pass those questions to our participants in the later portion of our event today. So now I'd like to welcome our five panelists who come from all parts of Colorado, from the Denver metro area to the Four Corners, from La Junta to Fort Collins. Today we're going to talk about a difficult topic of mental health. Um, communities across Colorado are dealing with increasing pressures and being open and honest about our feelings can help people deal with the challenges ahead of them more effectively. Across the country, rural, con rural counties have the highest rates of suicide. Anxiety and depression have worsened during the pandemic across the board and ag communities are feeling increasingly stressed about drought, wind, rising costs of everything from fuel to feed to fertilizer. And now we are also seeing a rise in animal disease, including um, highly pathogenic avian influenza, which has affected millions and millions of birds across the US. Through the work we're doing with our partners who are present on our panel here today, the Colorado Department of Agriculture is working to bring awareness and resources that to, to farmers and to um, share the resources that can help farmers and ranchers and their family members deal with stresses that come along with tending the land and caring for animals. Growing and raising food is a tough job and it takes dedication and resilience. And we know that that comes with a lot of mental health struggles as well. So today we're going to talk about why taking care of yourself by opening up to a neighbor or a friend or a counselor can help manage that stress and find healthier ways to deal with anxiety. So now I'd like to welcome our five panelists. And again, before I do that, I just want to remind you that if you're watching us on Facebook Live, we do want to keep this as a conversation. So please, if you have any questions, put those in our, uh, in our comments section and we will ask our participants those questions. So without further ado, I wanted to introduce our panelists today. Um, first, uh, we will hear from Clinton Wilson, who is with AgWell, um, which is a program connecting rural communities to stress management resources. Clinton, go ahead. Um, happy to be here. Uh, my name is Clinton Wilson. I work with AgWell, which is a program of Rocky Mountain Farmers Union. Uh, it's a grant funded program through the RASAP grant through Washington State University and also getting support through the Colorado Department of Agriculture and the Colorado Trust. Um, AgWell has a uh, mission to support well-being in agriculture, and we do this mostly through um, seminars, workshops, and uh, networking collaborations, supporting people with stress management and general uh, physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Thanks, Clinton. Next, I'd like to introduce Marielle Balbuena, who is from the La Plata Family Centers Coalition, and Marielle works directly with ag workers in the Four Corners region of Colorado. Welcome, Marielle. Hi, hello everyone. Happy to be here as well. I'm Mariel Babuena. I'm with the La Plata Family Centers Coalition and the center has several programs and services, uh, but the um, relation to farmers and workers has to do with the Together We Grow project. It's a three years uh, initiative to support uh, immigrants, migrants, and the represented community members who are invested in growing food, taking care of their mental health, and starting uh, entrepreneurship, um, especially with youth. So that's how can, you know, we're part of this amazing uh, initiative uh, through the Colorado Health Foundation and the Colorado Department of Agriculture. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Marielle. Up next is Rebecca Edlund with the Colorado Farm Bureau and the Colorado Agricultural Addiction and Mental Health Program, or CAMP, which provides six free counseling sessions with an ag provider who understands agricultural communities. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, thanks for having me. As Olga mentioned, my name is Becca Edlund and I work for the Colorado Farm Bureau. Um, Colorado Farm Bureau started asking questions about how to do barrier mitigation um, and stigma mitigation around mental health in the agricultural community to address the specific um, rise in suicide um, in our population. So in order to address that, we had to ask a lot of questions. And what we heard was that folks wanted something that was anonymous. It was ag friendly, so folks understood agriculture. It was free and it was available remotely. Um, and so that's what we did. We built a program called the Colorado Agricultural Addiction and Mental Health Program. And that program is available to any resident in the state of Colorado, but specifically targeting ag ag agrarian, sorry, and rural community members. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, last but certainly not least, I'd like to in introduce Chad Resnicek from the Agribility Program, which provides assistive technology to farmers and ranchers. Hi, Chad. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Also honored to be here. Appreciate being part of a group that's really working hard to make a difference in their community. So thank you for the chance. And I work for a Colorado Agribility Project, which has historically focused on supporting farmers, ranchers, and their families in overcoming physical uh, illness or injuries and finding ways to support them, find accommodations that allow them to overcome those limitations and remain in this profession. And my position came about as a result of a three-year grant project to sp focus specifically on behavioral health, um, reducing stressors related to a whole range of the gamut for behavioral health concerns and suicide uh, risks. And um, I've been a clinician for 20 years and was able, fortunate enough to join this team in July of the preceding year. So relatively new at it, but making some good connections and looking forward to what we can do to help make a difference. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for sharing a little bit about your organizations. You know, you are all doing incredible work to help support our farmers, ranchers. Um, and so I'm ready to get started on our conversation and hear your thoughts. So I'm going to start us off with a few questions and we'll direct them at our specific panelists. But of course, you all have experience in these topics. So if you feel that there's anything you'd like to contribute once the first speaker has been finished, please definitely feel free to jump into this conversation. And again, if you're watching us on Facebook Live, welcome. This is a facilitated discussion and we are hoping that you will engage with us. So if you have questions about anything that our panelists are saying, or you have general questions about where to find resources, how to learn more, or you know what to do if a loved one is facing any sort of um, troubles, please let us know uh, in the comments section of Facebook and we will pass those questions on to our panelists. So uh, my first question, I think Rebecca, you might be the best suited to answer this. Can you tell us a little bit about the realities and struggles of people who are working in the ag community in particular? And you know, does that stress present differently in those agricultural communities? Happy to answer. Um, so farmers and ranchers face similar stressors to the rest of us who live in the urban corridors, um, we are all impacted by family or community stressors, by market shifts or economic um, changes. But in farming and ranching, that sense is intensified um, by location. They're geographically often um, disparate or separated from access to certain resources. They are socially isolated sometimes by choice, but definitely um, by necessity in some, some capacities. They live in small communities where community transparency is high. So folks know a lot about you even if you haven't shared it. They rely on limited control factors. So commodities are out of their control. The weather's out of their control. The input costs are out of their control. And so as they engage in those specific realities, um, they have to face them with tremendous strength um, and tenacity, but the resources um, around mental health specifically have been largely stigmatized. Um, they're very vulnerable in that conversation. 
and often don't have access to care in general. So it, it is, like I said, very similar to the rest of us living in urban centers, um, but with much more intensified implications. Well, I was muted this time. Thanks, Rebecca. Appreciate that. So Hannah, welcome. Thanks. I'm so glad you were able to join us. I know there were some technical difficulties. Glad we worked them out. Um, if you could introduce yourself, um, tell us just a little bit about who you are and what you do. Hi, everyone. I'm so sorry I was late. It, my computer did not want to cooperate and I did not have the everything set up correctly. But my name is Hannah Bates. I work for Southeast Health Group. I am the Agricultural Outreach Coordinator here at the Coffee Break Project in Rocky Ford, Colorado. Our program is geared to helping ranchers and farmers with their everyday lives, stress, finances, physical therapy, mental health, anything that they need help with, any, anything on their plate. I'm that sounding board that they come to to talk with and then I navigate them to where they need to go, or I'm just that friendly face that they come and have coffee and donuts with and talk about their day and their lives. Thanks, Hannah. So, um, you know, we're just getting kicked off in this discussion, and you know, you're a rancher yourself down in Southern Colorado. So I was wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit about your firsthand experience with agricultural stress. And, you know, I know that the program you're running called the Coffee Break Project, the slogan is, do you look after your neighbors as close as as close as your crop or herd? And so, you know, I think I'd love to hear from you a little bit about why that's your slogan. Why is it important to check in on your neighbors? Tell us a little bit. So my husband and I, we own a ranch here in Manzanola, Colorado, and we used to do beef cattle as well as specialty crops, growing them for seed to sell to the local seed banks that we have here, as well as raising alfalfa. Um, with any crop and farming, there's always a struggle between, is there enough water? How is the weather? How is the market? You know, everyday stressors with money, finances, and just balancing your life between farming and being that worker and home and family life is a struggle in itself. You may get in the tractor and be there all day long and not come in until everyone's had dinner and the kids are off to bed and you're out in the tractor the next morning before they leave for school. So our stressors that we have are just, I mean, you have to grow your crop and make enough money through your growing season to sustain your family through winter until that crop is growing again. So it's a fine act of balancing finances and lots of hope and prayer and duct tape and <laughs> keeping it all together. So the, what we try and do here is you want to look after your herd as closely and your friends as closely as each other, your neighbors. I mean, my neighbors honestly are our family. It's our relatives. Like I have moved three times and I've lived down the same road our entire growing years and stuff that we've had on our farm almost 20 years so we do check in on each other if somebody is sick if they're ill like you call them you see how they're doing we have a gentleman at the coffee break project that he didn't come a couple times and that's not like him not to call not to show up so we reached out to him and he was having some medical issues so you know, we all banded together and to see what we could do and provide for them. And that's part of being the ranching farming community is just helping each other out, being those olive branches that if somebody's sick, somebody's ill, you don't just say, oh, I'll stop by and visit. You actually hold up on your promise and stop by to see what that person needs because they might need just somebody to talk to that day. They might need help getting the kids to school. They might need dinner that day or help with their machinery. And so whatever we can help each other with is what that farming ranching community really is. Thanks, Hannah. You know, and you and Rebecca both mentioned this, right? There are so many pieces out of your control as a farmer or a rancher that you have to deal with no matter what. 
Uh, and you know, those sometimes are, are long-term, right? Drought has been happening for 20 years in Colorado and yet right. we, we are still trying to plant things and harvest mm -hmm. them, right? And yep. so they, they result in this long-term stress. So my next question is for Clinton and I'm hoping Clinton that you can help us uh, give us some strategies or tell us, you know, what type of strategies do you recommend for folks who are dealing with these multiple stressors in, in these uncertain times? Yeah, you know, stress affects all of us differently. Uh, the point you made about the long-term unaddressed stress are the ones that cause the most uh, health concerns for people. Um, stress usually affects our uh, circulatory system and our heart the most, um, increasing our blood pressure and our pulse. And uh, this can lead to increased risk for heart attack, stroke, uh, kidney disease. It can also affect people's sleep. It can affect people's digestion. And so recognizing that long-term stress is something that's impacting you is important. Um, Agwell does a number of trainings and we try to um, offer strategies that are accessible to anyone. And we find that different things work better for different people, exercise works for some people, creativity and art works for others. But the most universal one that um, really has been shown by the data and by the science community and the healthcare community to be the most effective and accessible for everyone is really just slowing down your breath. And I can say from experience, um, we teach a method called box breathing, which is a uh, four second inhale, a four second hold, a four second exhale, and then a four second hold. And really breathing in slowly, filling up your uh, chest and your stomach, holding and letting that go. And I practice this every night before I go to bed. It really does help me to calm down, to let go, and to uh, focus on my breath. We all breathe like somewhere between 20 and 30,000 times a day. And we don't focus on many of those breaths. But when I'm stressed and people that I work with, um, when they report like focusing on that breath, it really does take them to a moment where they can slow down and feel the relief. So there's lots of other things. I want to point out what Hannah said. The other thing that we really focus on with people is getting them to connect in those moments of stress and anxiety. And when you're feeling um, maybe hopeless in a way that you're not normally, we have a tendency to want to withdraw, but that's really the last thing that we encourage people to do. Plugging in with people that you can belong with, people that you can trust and just let somebody know, it makes a world of difference. So that's the Agwell perspective. And I think that it's fairly universal, but look up box breathing if you haven't and give it a try. I don't know about everyone else on this call, but I definitely started box breathing once you explained it. So, um, you know, and I, I, I try to practice that myself, but you're right. This is a great reminder that, you know, sometimes you just forget about the simple thing that we do every single second of our lives, which is breathing and how much that can actually affect not just our well being, but, you know, our stress levels and so many different things. So my next question, uh, Marielle, will be for you because you at La Plata Family Center uh, Coalition, you deal with more than just mental health. You're a full service uh, clinic that deals with both physical and mental health issues. And so, you know, when we talk about these external stressors, increasing costs, drought, um, you know, clearly counseling cannot change some of those factors. So what are some of these benefits of talking about these feelings with a health professional? Thank you, Olga, for that question. Um, you know, through all the work that we have been doing through so many years at the center, especially with the farming and satellite gardens, we realized that there was a huge benefit for, for those who would come to work the land to connect with each other and to have a professional mental health provider there to guide sometimes those conversations that they were having with peers, with fellow farmers or gardeners. And sometimes just the being outdoors, experiencing um, stress while you're working the land and, and, and most the stressors that Hannah was sharing, you know, it's so out of our control. Uh, it's super beneficial. It, it boils down to very basic interaction, human interactions, the ability to be heard, the ability to 
express your feelings and by talking about your feelings with a professional, sometimes you, you have a deeper understanding of where you are at. And sometimes you start understanding a little bit with their support, what things you can do to better yourself and the peer to peer support, it has been crucial. I think that, like Hannah said, it's a very interesting community. When you are in rural Colorado, you're part of those ranchers and farmers and the immigrant community. We are all in together. And so I think that being connected, feeling heard, even if the mental health provider, all he's doing is doing active listening and guiding those conversations and prompting more questions so you can do deep, uh, self-reflection of where you are at with your mental health is very beneficial. And the other component is that we are trying really hard to, to remove that stigma that when we want to take care of our mental health, there's something wrong with us. So our messaging is like, if you have a toothache, you go to the dentist. If, if something happened to your leg, you go to the emergency room. So if you're having some anxiety, depression, and, and you're having thoughts that you probably shouldn't be having, just seek some mental health provider because our, our mind is as important as our heart, our blood pressure, or our tooth. So those are kind of my initial thoughts for that question. Thank you. Thanks, Marielle. You know, and this always makes me think of the fact that our primary care physicians often become our first line of response to mental health issues. And, you know, I know that they become the, the providers that use you see mo most often. And so uh, talking about that with your primary care provider is a great first step to really take a, a better understanding of your own mental health and the stressors that are affecting you. So um, Chad, my next question is for you. Well, you know, as we just talked with Mariel, those physical and mental health aspects are related to each other to each other. Um, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about how you and your experience have seen them affect each other either way, right? Physical health affecting mental health and vice versa. Yeah, thank you. It is definitely a two-way street. And I think both Clinton and Mariel alluded to that pretty well in their, in their discussions. For us within the AgriAbility uh, project, typically what we'll, what we'll do is our our farm specialist will go out and do a site visit, take about up to three hours, follow someone around, meet with all the main stakeholders there in the family, and kind of look at how are they doing navigating whatever the illness it could be something as simple as aging, it could be uh, related to an accident, um, but get a thorough assessment of how someone's doing and what could be done to increase their functioning. And part of this process was to do a quality of life survey at the beginning, at that initial visit, and then afterwards, once whatever uh, recommendations, accommodations, resources could be put in place. And what they found through the course of this, and this, this has been done across 14 states that have been gathering data for agribility uh, projects. And what they found was that by doing the physical um, assessments and accommodations, that people's psychological well being increased by 28%, their existential well being by 21%, and then their perceived level of support by 20%. So the idea being that just by helping the with the physical well-being, we also get the added benefit of these other areas. The idea then was to be very intentional and also trying to take a holistic approach, addressing physical and behavioral well-being, because we know that those two are so intimately linked. And so if you think about, um, I mean, there's a, there's a ton of research on this link too, and some of the most substantial comes from the Kaiser Permanente and Center for Disease Control, the ACEs study, or uh, adverse childhood experiences, looking at uh, people in their formatory years ex ex exposed to significant events statistically have a much greater chance of, in, in the more exposure to these events, and I, I can't remember if there's 11 of them, I can't remember exactly, but the more that you were exposed to, the greater your risk for a wide range of health and emotional well-being problems and much uh, shorter life expectancy as well. So we've known this for quite a while. And the need to take care of things on both sides is, is hugely important. I love Mariel's point about we're, we tend not to be resistant to going and getting medical help. And if you look at uh, WebMD, that website gets almost 180 um, unique visitors per month. 
And so I'm guessing what drives that is the need for people to understand what's going on in their lives, to get information, to get a better sense. Now, granted, that's no substitute for professional medical advice. And I think a lot of medical providers may have mixed feelings about people going to the internet to get their information, but I think it speaks to the curiosity and drive and in, in that if we have information, if we have trusted sources we can go to, if we can understand and shift the question from what's wrong with me to what's happening to me, it removes a sense of self-blaming. It, it removes that sort of personal sense of being damaged or broken, but instead looking at what's going on, what's the information, how do I get the best support for that? And we do want to make that conversation as vitally important for medical issues as we do for, for our mental well-being as well. Thanks for that. Yeah, you know, it always, um... We, we always want to go see people when our stomach hurts, right? But we don't always think about it. Well, you know, today I'm not feeling well mentally. Maybe that's something I should see a doctor for. And it always um, catches me off guard whenever I read what, uh, about the brain and gut connection. And I find that so incredibly interesting. And we say, you know, go with your gut, go with your feeling, but really your, your brain and your gut are connected. And so when you get that gut feeling, it's almost like a brain response, right? So it just, it's such an interesting topic to me. Um, um, about how physical and mental health just are completely connected. Um, so my next question is broad. So I'd like to, all of you to kind of jump in and, and give me a response. Um, and we're all from around the state. Hannah, you're down in Southwest, Col Southeast Colorado. Mariel's down in Southwestern Colorado. Chad and Clinton, you're kind of up North, but really all over the state. And so I was hoping you can tell me a little bit uh, in your communities that you're most familiar with, what are some of the uh, resources available to folks as far as mental health? Maybe Hannah, let's start with you because I think you have a pretty good answer there. So in the area that I live in and the company I work for, we have Southeast Mental Health, which we've renamed to Southeast Health Group because for generations and generations, it's only been mental health. And so the community, the farmers, the ranchers, they shunned away from going to these facilities for help because they didn't want to have that label on them. So Southeast Health Group, it helps a broad range from mental health, addiction, we have physical therapy, we have counselors, we have actually alternative medicine, which are our chiropractors, massage therapists, acupuncturists that work with our group. I mean, physical therapy, hydro pools, you name it, and we probably have it. And if we don't, then we're probably looking into getting it. So that is one of the largest resources in our area that people can go. It has a distinctive umbrella logo that everyone from far and wide, when they see that, that they associate that umbrella with Southeast Health. And you have multiple locations down in the Southeast Colorado, don't you? Where are your locations? We do. We have one in Springfield, Colorado, Lamar, Colorado, Eads, Colorado, Rocky Ford, and Lahaina, Colorado. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mariel, how about you? Can you tell us a little bit more about the Four Corners region? Sure. So um, we have a lot of partners in our area, including Access Health Systems. They manage most of the mental health uh, services in our area, um, and they're expanding to other counties. I think it's six uh, county region uh, right now. Uh, but specifically to the Family Center, and thanks to this uh, opportunity to uh, partner with all of you guys, um, we are currently offering mental health um, consultations free of charge. Uh, to um, migrants, immigrants, and farmers who are um, in our area who would like to seek some more assistance. And we offer simultaneous translation, Spanish, English. Um, everything is confidential. They don't have to go through us, just get the phone number of the uh, mental health provider. And then they set up the time, the, uh, the provider coordinates with the interpreter. It's very, very um, confidential. And they also come uh, every Saturday um, when we have our big working days at the uh, pond farm. We have an interpreter and this uh, works at wellness coordinator who provi provides yoga and breathing techniques and MI. 
uh, and also the uh, Mary Catherine who facilitates mental health uh, consultations. And I think that that has been very effective because um, the help is right there and you are with your family and she can also facilitate uh, family therapy. She's certified to do that as well. So that's one of the uh, services. And um, I think that just calling um, the center uh, is a good idea. We are a, a resource and referral agency. So if we don't have it in the house, we'll find it for you. <laughs> Thanks. That's wonderful. And just if you're watching on Facebook, we'll make sure that we will put all these resources on our uh, CDA website in our blog section. So if you go to CDA's website, which is ag.colorado.gov and scroll down, you'll find our blog. Well, after we wrap up our, our discussion today, we'll make sure to post both the video from this webinar as well as any of the resources that we mentioned today um, in that post. And again, if you have any questions and you're watching us on Facebook Live, please do ask those questions in the comment section and we will pass those on to our participants. Rebecca, I see that you have unmuted. I'd love to hear more from you about camp and anything else that you'd like to share with us as far as resources. Well, this is gonna be a shameless plug for camp, but I'd also just like to highlight um, agribility. For farmers and ranchers, they often don't hear that a resource exists for physical adaptation of their working environment if they're injured. And so for this particular group to know that AgriBility does that kind of work so that if they hear about a farmer and rancher, an ag worker who is injured, um, that can even be something like trauma, PTSD, um, where noise or some kind of um, exercise is, is limiting them. Um, have them connect to Chad. He's phenomenal. He'll connect them to the right resources. But then for camp, and that is available statewide. Um, for camp, I just love to see folks utilizing the program that is designed with agriculture at its core. Um, it is not a, a publicly resourced, um, I mean, it is funded by some, some public dollars, but it was started for and by agriculturalists. Um, it as a means of caring well for their neighbors, um, wanting them to be able to access care in a way that is culturally appropriate. And so, so much of that is shaped by farmers and ranchers and Colorado Farm Bureau represents all of them. Um, agriculturally, we, we represent um, all of the various commodity and interests in the state. And so really could speak to that. It is remotely available. So for those folks who are in areas where there is a tremendous shortage um, or no services available, this is a great opportunity. We also have an agricultural addiction, um, sorry, an adolescent addiction support workshop. And we've been partnering with Chad at AgriBility, but also um, Erica Jones from Ames Community College to teach that. And it is designed for parents of adolescents experiencing addiction. It is a terrible, um, story to walk. Um, that path is hard, but Chad and Erica give really tangible, very, very necessary resources to parents caring for, for adolescents in that space. And so we'll be hopefully announcing the next dates for the coming year soon. Uh, and I just encourage you, if you know somebody who's in that situation, feel free to connect them to me personally, and I'll make sure they know when dates are happening, but um, it is a great opportunity and resource availability. Thank you, Rebecca. And I think this is a great transition to Chad. Chad, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about AgriBility. I know from our work with your program, um, we've seen things, you know, as simple as gloves helping people. And then, you know, as big as a specialized ATV that helps people do the work they were doing before without, you know, to overcome any sort of physical disabilities that they may have. Um, gotten as a result of an accident or, you know, anything that has happened, right? And because as we said, mental health and physical health are so closely connected when you can no longer go out and care for your cows or, you know, do the work that you've been so used to doing for ages, that can reflect in your mental health, right? So Chad, tell us a little bit more about the type of work AgriBility does. Sure. So we, right now we have two amazing specialists that go out and do those on-site visits. One is uh, Candy Leathers, uh, the other is uh, James Craig. 
and they've been doing this for a long time. They're super dedicated to this community and their ability to go out and watch how someone interacts with their operation and kind of see the, uh, the accommodations that someone's already had to make for themselves. And, you know, farmers and ranchers by far going all the way back to my grandparents were uh, kind of ad hoc engineers and able to cobble whatever they need to, to keep the job going. And sometimes you do that with your body too. So if your left leg isn't working the way you need to, you end up putting more weight on your right and things tend to get out of whack. And, and sometimes it's as simple as just getting another handle so that you've got three points of contact as you're getting up into equipment or into machinery to try to make sure you don't lose your balance or anything like that. And so they can do everything from gloves that reduce vibration while you know using heavy machinery. Because if you expose yourself to that over time, odds are you're going to struggle to hold a pencil at the end of the day. And so it could be something that small all the way up to specialized lifts to get a wheelchair or get from a wheelchair up into a combine or other high profile equipment. So they do a fantastic job. And as uh, Becca mentioned, if anyone knows of anyone with injuries and needs to get some help just being able to sustain their operation, they're a fantastic resource in that area. And they travel all over the state. They'll go wherever in Colorado to do, to do um, site visits and get people linked up to that as they need to. And then lastly, in terms of my part, I'll work with anyone across the state to get them connected to the right resources regarding behavioral health. One of the things we do is partner with a farm aid hotline. So for anyone in our area, farm aid, 1-800-FARM-AID is a great ag specific resource to do everything from financial and legal support to um, behavioral health crisis or even suicide risk. So they're a great resource and people that call in in the Western part of the country, that maybe having a behavioral concern can have me uh, follow up with them within another business day to get them connected to services in their area. So I'll try to navigate all the, the insurance aspects, um, go through all the footwork and hurdles because I'm a bit more familiar with that system that may, may cause someone else to drop out if they run into roadblock after roadblock. And I can tell you from doing this with a number of states, in a lot of ways, we're very fortunate in Colorado to have the resources that we do. And if we look at the best way to support populations is through um, access, acceptability, affordability, and awareness of those services. So something like CAMP, uh, which provides no cost services and to be able to get people into services very quickly is fantastic. It's a great resource. The work that Hannah and those guys down there at Southeast are doing um, to be able to have that sort of community buy-in and that collaboration, uh, it's a fantastic model. Mariel, it's awesome to learn about some of the stuff you're doing because I know that's a population that's really in need of some specialized services and I'm glad to see we've got some things going there. And then Clinton, I've had good fortune to work with his, his wellness program and his outreach and um, I just, I feel honored to be part of this and kind of knowing who the champions are and who are the people that are dedicated to this aspect and that aspect so that we're not reinventing the wheel and we're not, you know, exposing people to change saturation and too much at one time. So I like any opportunity we have to talk together, figure out what everyone's doing, how we can best link up, be smart and efficient in our efforts to be able to help make a difference. So, so to you guys um, at CDA, we appreciate the opportunity to have this format. Thanks, Chad. And Clinton, yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about the statewide, you know, your program is statewide, right? So tell us a little bit more about AgWell and, you know, recently you've, you've changed the name of your program. Maybe start us out by telling us why, because I think that'll lead to a good discussion, right? Yeah, and AgWell as a program of Rocky Mountain Farmers Union actually serves three states, New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming. And here in Colorado, we've been uh, lucky to partner with uh, some of the folks on this call um, this morning. One of our AgWell programs is a uh, every week we do a uh, Wednesday workshop. In this past six uh, weeks, we've been focusing on well-being and different aspects of well-being. And one of the farmers that was on there, I had uh, referred to the camp program, and they got on today and told me that they emailed they got referred and they saw a counselor all in the same day. And they were so excited and they knew that if they had tried to go through that path in town, trying to find somebody that could work them in, they were just, you know, at, at their end of not knowing what to do with that process. And so when I recommended camp, I, uh, I was hopeful just from my interactions with Rebecca and uh, yeah, they reported back today that they had their first session. They loved their counselor. It was a super easy process. So with AgWell, we 
um, are doing different programs throughout uh, the three states. Um, and this past week I was in Route County. We did a training with a group of farmers from the Northwest corner of the state. And we give them uh, some resources at agwell.org. You can find resources for the different states, but um, one of those is camp. Uh, one of them is the farm aid hotline. And one of them is a farm stress hotline. And, um, you know, our hope is really just to collaborate with different organizations that are doing great work around the state, getting people connected there, and then giving them some tangible tools, how to better deal with their stress. Stress is a uh, major contributor to uh, mental, physical, emotional pain. And uh, then also we like to get upstream so that we can give them some well-being tips that really keep them healthy and well. So when those stressors do come up, they're better able to respond. Um, and just back to your beginning question about uh, ARPAN to Agwell, we were originally called the Rural Peer Assistance Network, and we're still hoping to build out that network, but uh, that was harder for people to relate to. We felt like that Agwell kind of had a name that people could immediately relate to and maybe be curious about going and finding agwell.org. Our pan was a little bit harder of a sale, it sounded a little bit like a Disney movie or something. Thanks. Yeah, I think Agwell really captures what you're what you're trying to do with your program. So I think we have uh, time for maybe about one more question and then we'll we'll wrap up our conversation with any last minute thoughts. So um, for my last question, and we've we've talked about this a little bit, but um, I'd love to hear from all of you. You know, there is so much stigma around mental health, not just in rural communities. It's everywhere, right? It's it's in communities that are rural and urban. Um, it's just all throughout. So, how can we battle that stigma? How do we make sure that people feel comfortable asking for help when they need it? So, Olga, if it's okay, I'd like to start that question. Um, and I'd just like to start by saying we have to tell our own stories. Um, folks who meet me, engage me, um, they think of me as a normal person. I think you can ask some of these folks here if they think of me as a normal person. Um, I'm pretty high functioning. I present, you know, pretty put together. Um, but the story in my family is one that faces addiction, um, depression, anxiety, um, my husband and I are in marriage counseling, and I remember I'm myself seeking therapy. And those words are really hard to say, um, to, to own, like, I'm not okay, and I needed help, or I need help. And so I remember the first time I was having this conversation with a couple in my church, and I said, yeah, my husband and I are going to see a marriage counselor. And they said, yeah, we just think it's like an oil change. And I was furious with them because it took us some, some time and a good bit of courage to actually muster up enough energy to go talk to someone. And here was this couple who'd been around a lot and had never shared that that was something they valued in their marriage. Um, and I think we just need to normalize that. And it means being a little vulnerable, talking about the fact that we too struggle and need care. And that creates opportunity and space for someone else to walk that path alongside us. Um, and not to say that I'm the coolest person around, but we can all present with a certain face. And sometimes it's hard to see that the people around us need care too and are, are seeking help. So I just encourage folks in the ad community, tell your story. It may be a life-saving effort that you don't even realize you're just sharing a story, but it could, save a friend's life. Yeah, I think that vulnerability really is hard for people to achieve, right? Um, especially when we all put up a face, right? We all put up a face to go out into public and to get our jobs done. And, you know, even to our kids who, uh, who need to see us as, you know, guiding figures, right? So we all put up that face and to let that guard down enough to say, yeah, I seek therapy or yeah, I'm, I'm on medication because my anxiety is through the roof, which happens to be true for me. So, uh, you know, those are things that we don't necessarily want to talk about, but are important to share so that other people understand that this is a thing that happens to all of us. Does anyone else have any thoughts on how to kind of combat that stigma of mental health? So I agree with everything that Becca said. And, you know, there's some research that points out to the being one of the biggest predictors of help seeking behaviors in rural communities 
the biggest indicator there is prior knowledge of mental illness or mental health information. And so I think anything we do to get normalize that conversation is a big part of being able to reduce stigma. Now I will say stigma operates in two ways. One may be my own reluctance to say I need help and to reach out. And you know that's up to each of us as individuals to figure out, are we motivated enough to try to get some help and get there? The other piece I think that's important to understand is, and that's what each of us have control over too, is how do we respond when, we, when people do bring this up? Because I think part of the, the challenge is me reaching out for help. The other is being able to be okay and be comfortable when someone is in a vulnerable position and being able to hold that space with them. That can sometimes be more difficult. And I think it's just important to know that you can't say anything wrong. If you're coming from a place of care, that may be the biggest thing that can make a difference. We know from the interpersonal theory of suicide that two of the biggest risk factors in terms of very severe or fatal suicide um, acts of suicide, the two biggest risk factors are one, feeling disconnected from other people and two, feeling like a burden. So if we can allow people to feel valued, to let them know that we honor who they are, we recognize their contributions, what they have to offer, and we value who they are as people, we can go a long ways to addressing those risk factors just in terms of how we carry ourselves with other people and expressing real concern. So when we ask, how are you feeling today? It's more than just accepting fine. It's, are you sure? Because it seems like you've had a lot on your plate lately. And so just taking that extra moment to make it clear that we are connected, that we care about people, I think that goes a long way, so. To tie in with Chad, so at Southeast, we offer the Comet training, which is changing our mental and emotional trajectory. And that is what that program is geared to do. It's geared for when you're passing somebody on the street, at the market, the post office, wherever you may be, and you say, how are you? How, how are you today? And they turn around and talk to you and tell you, oh, I'm good. Don't just right away go, okay, thanks. Have a good day and move about your way. Be like, oh, really engage with that person and have that conversation with them. And if they, somebody approaches you to talk to you about what, something that is going on, really listening to them and understanding what they're saying to you instead of just like, oh, I have to go do this and I, I'll talk to you later. Like really taking the time to listen to them because nine times out of 10, that's all somebody really wants. They want to be validated. They want to have somebody listen to what is going on in their life. And that might be the difference between somebody taking their life or somebody having a good day. And so at Comet, they teach you the three things, like really engage with that person, listen to what they're talking about, hearing what they're saying. And then helps you to, okay, is this just, I just need to listen. I just need to be there and present for that person. Or do I need to help find that person a service and put them, take them to there, have a warm handoff between them and the counseling service that I'm taking them to, or rerouting it to be like, okay, let's set up a time to come and have coffee, go and have dinner with each other and listen to what our trials are that we need to get off of our chest. Thanks, Hannah. That's super important to hear. Um, you know, one thing that I've heard in the past is, you know, people just want to be heard, right? And sometimes they just want to be heard and sometimes they need help solving their problems. And so I know when my kids come to me with their problems, and this is probably, you know, a, a big generalization, right? I ask them, are we here to listen or am I here to solve problems, right? Because if all they need for me is to, to hear them out and to acknowledge their pain or whatever they're struggling with, that's what I'm here for. If we're here to figure out how to talk back to a bully, we can do that too, but sometimes that's not what they need, right? So I've been trying to use that question in my own personal life and I started with my kids, but now I use it with adults as well. And it has really become a, a very handy tip for me, right? Sometimes my friends, they just wanna talk about what's wrong. And sometimes we really need to figure out how to solve their problems. So that question of, am I here to help, listen, or am I here to help is, has been really helpful for me personally. Even. 
So it's almost time for us to wrap up. We've had such a great conversation. I hate to cut us short, but um, we are almost at two o'clock. So I'd like to wrap up with just everyone, if you have any closing thoughts that you want to leave us with or anything that you'd like to share either about your program or anything, um, I would love to hear those now. And Rebecca, I see you've unmuted. So let's start yeah. with you. Sorry, I just, hearing Chad and Hannah share, I just wanted to challenge folks. If you're listening to this conversation and there's someone that comes to mind, um, or if you pause and you think about who in your community might be hurting right now or need to hear from you, that gut mind connection, that thing there that Olga was sharing, um, just send them a text and tell them that they're valuable to you. Um, you don't have to say, I think you might be hurting right now, or I, I think you might be struggling. Just affirm them, say that you are significant to me and I value you. And that is so important. Thanks, Rebecca. Marielle. I just love everything that everyone said. And uh, for us here, the center is truly that, taking the time to have a cup of tea or coffee and being present and value the time that has been granted between our you know, staff members and our farmers and our friends and our clients, just the ability to sometimes just listen and be absolutely present and commitment, committed to clear your mind, open your heart, and show that with your body language so people know that you're coming from absolutely no judgment, very transparent, and always assume that something is happening to that person. So no matter what face they come in and they put on, just you don't know what's happening. So always show kindness, respect, and be transparent in your interactions because that's what's gonna move us forward as human beings and together to a better future. Thank you, everyone. Clinton, any closing thoughts from you as I unmute myself? Yeah, you know, I'm always inspired by the uh, tagline that they have down at the uh, Southeast Health Group of looking after your uh, neighbor as well as you look after your um, crops and your herd. Uh, but the thing that I always want to add on there is to also look after yourself. If something's coming up for you, um, don't wait, you know, particularly if it's a physical thing. Um, I recently lost a friend to cancer and they waited a long time to go to the doctor. And once they did, it had already really spread, but there's things going on in our bodies. There's things going on in our mind. And if we don't address them early, they just tend to get worse. And your livestock, your crops, your neighbor, they need you to be healthy and well, and they need you to stick around um, as does your family and your friends and the other people in your life. So that's my closing thought is take care of yourself too. Thanks, Clinton. Chad, how about you? Any closing thoughts for us? Sure. I think, you know, we kind of began this conversation talking about some of those stressors that are super unique to, to agriculture as an occupation and so much about what people face that are beyond their control, that we can't change those things. I hope that as you know, things go forward, there are better policies, there's better protective mechanisms in place, but we can't control all those factors. So for the sake of efficiency and taking care of ourselves and others, it makes sense to really zero in on those things we do have control over, which is our well-being, our physical health, our emotional health, and especially our relationships. So anything that supports that, and there are a lot of resources in terms of people and programs around this state. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you, Chad. Hannah, bring us home. Any closing thoughts from you? Well, I want to thank you for having us. And I am so thankful and blessed to have each and every one of you on today and learn a little bit about your organizations and tie it in with Southeast. Um, just reach out to somebody. If you're struggling, come to coffee. Eat the donuts so I don't have to. That's what I tell everyone. You can take as many with you as you'd like. And just find somebody, find a group, find friends that you can go and have those conversations with, help them, help yourself. Because sometimes listening to somebody and helping them with their struggles helps you deal with something that you might be dealing with yourself. And it's that sounding board of helping each other and stuff. You know, the ranch, ranching wives, we get together and have coffee and unload all of our burdens upon each other. And that's what we're here for. That's what these communities are here for is to help each other. 
And so if you are struggling, there's many groups throughout the state of Colorado, they can help you. Uh, we do offer a Comet training. Our next one is June 6th on Monday from 2 to 4 p.m. I'd love to have any of you that would like to come. Uh, just reach out to me and I appreciate everything. I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you so much. Well, thank you again so much for all of you participating today. Really appreciate your time. As I mentioned before, we will put this on our website at ag.colorado.gov. We will include the, the video from this panel today. We will include the materials that we've all discussed. And then I just wanted to close this off. We, we were specific to farmers and ranchers here today, but there is a statewide resource available to anyone who is struggling, whose loved ones are struggling, and that is Colorado Crisis Services. And you can call them anytime. They are available 24 seven. You can call or text. They're uh, reachable at 1-844-493-TALK, or you can text TALK to 38255. And so um, if you, you know, if any of these resources we've mentioned to today, um, they seem like the right ones for you, please call and let people know that you're struggling and seek the help that you need. So again, thank you all so much to all of our panelists. Thank you to all of you who've watched us on Facebook Live. And uh, we really appreciate your time today and appreciate all the work that you all are doing on uh, mental health here in Colorado. Thank you again. Take care, everyone. Thanks.